So welcome everyone. Thank you so, so much for joining us. My name is Maurice BP Weeks. I'm the co-director of the Action Center on Race and the Economy. It's amazing to be on the phone with so many of you tonight to talk about our Homes Guarantee campaign and what we can do together to win what we all deserve. Um, so many of you have joined us for the last several weeks uh, of these calls and we're so excited and glad to have you back. Some of you are joining for the first time this evening. Um, if you are, welcome. If you're on your computer, um, if you want to say hi and put the, your name and the city that you're calling in from in the chat box, uh, it's always fun to see where different folks are calling in from. Um, we have a super exciting program tonight. One of our greatest champions on this issue and so many others, Representative Ilhan Omar from Minnesota, is here to update us on the state of play in Washington, D.C., and um, really to co-conspire with us about how we can win rent and mortgage cancellation and the next stimulus package, um, and then a homes guarantee after that. So today we're gonna focus on federal policy, but as always, we wanna support you in your ongoing organizing. Um, so if you have any questions that come up about local issues that you're struggling with, um, uh, or any questions that you have about your campaigns, feel free to drop them uh, either in the chat box or if you're on Zoom, you'll see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen um, and drop them in there and we'll try and get to as many as we can. Before we get going, I wanna tell you a little bit about logistics uh, on this call. Because of how many people are on the phone, we have like over 115 people. Um, all of your lines are muted and uh, if your video, if you're joining on the computer or your phone uh, through the Zoom app, you'll be able to see the faces of the speakers like me, um, but we can't see you right now. Um, so again, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box or the chat. We're going to get to as many as possible. If you have technical difficulties, um, you can also drop that in the chat or you can email homes at peoplesaction.org. Um, if you're not on one of the Zoom apps, but just dialed in by phone, welcome. Very, very glad that you're here. Um, so very exciting for this call. We have simultaneous Spanish translation. Um, so if you are on the Zoom app to switch over to the Spanish language channel, you can click the button that says interpretation at the bottom of your screen uh, and change it from English to Spanish. If you've dialed in by phone, um, by phone only and need interpretation, if it's at all possible for you to uh, download and install the Zoom app and dial back in, that's where the interpretation will be available. Uh, and just so you know, we are recording this call to share uh, with our many comrades who weren't able to join us tonight. We don't intend for this to be a media call. We didn't invite any media to the call, um, but uh, as we're going forward, you should assume that uh, the questions and everything are public. Um, finally, we hope to wrap this call by the end of the hour um, to give you back the rest of your evening. Um, so now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Rose Fernandez, uh, who's a leader with uh, Community Voices Heard, CVH in New York. Rose, take it away. Hello, thank you, Maurice. Hi, everybody. Uh... Can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, yeah. Okay, great. Um, my name is Rose Fernandez. I'm a member leader with Community Voices Heard and a resident of New York City Public Housing for over 30 years. And I remember growing up in public housing when it actually worked, but we all know that that's not the case anymore. And thinking of how public housing got this way really infuriates me. We don't get the money that we're supposed to get in order to make the necessary repairs we need to fix leaks, to get rid of black mold, and repair broken heaters. We have seen 30 years of disinvestment in public housing, which is 30 years of disinvestment in our health. On top of that, with the little money that they have received, there's also been mismanagement, corruption, and gross negligence. This has led to conditions that have made us more vulnerable to the coronavirus. 
I haven't seen any NYCHA staff cleaning in my building. So I've been doing my part. I bought antibacterial wipes and spray, and I've been wiping down the doorknob um, here, the elevator buttons, um, the handle to go in and out of the building, the handle for the trash chute, because NYCHA is not doing it. And we've spoken to workers and representatives of the union in NYCHA who told us that workers do not have the kinds of masks, gloves, PPE that they need in order to protect themselves. And they don't even have salt to kill the virus, you know, to, to clean up with. And some of them told us that they have been told to use only water to clean. Uh, <laughs> and as someone whose own personal health has been impacted by years of disinvestment, I can't afford for NYCHA to not keep our building clean during this crisis. And the same with so many across NYCHA who have the same conditions. Uh, I, I suffer myself personally from migraines and unfortunately living in public housing has made my migraines much harder to manage and many times has even sent me to the ER. And you know, over the years, not being able to do anything about fixing this problem has caused a lot of depression over the years and a lot of negative thoughts. And I've had feelings of hopelessness with no end. And I even planned on ending my life, okay? But organizing with Community Voices Heard has been a lifeline. And I know that had it not been for being found while Gabriel Strakota from Community Voices was canvassing in my building four years ago, I wouldn't be here today, okay? And I thank God for that, because that's when my life turned around. I would have never imagined that me, a simple high school grad who was a stay-at-home mom, could have become the fearless, fierce warrior woman that I am today, fighting for the rights of all who are opposed, I'm sorry, oppressed, and fighting for a home's guarantee. This moment right now calls for us, all of us, to step into our power as organizers, to organize our neighbors and demand dignity in housing. We can and we must win. And I just want to thank you for giving me this time. Well, thank you, Rose. Um, I really appreciate your leadership, your work. Um, you're truly a powerful leader. Um, and your perspective on the way that we failed the folks in public housing really resonates with me. Uh, my mother lives in the Stuyvesant, a public housing building on downtown Buffalo, New York, um, and deals with the exact same issues. Um, I also share your vision for a homes guarantee that invests and centers public housing and housing that's guaranteed for a public good. My name is John Washington. I'm an organizer with the National Campaign to Win a Homes Guarantee, and I um, wanted to offer some thoughts and grounding before we dig in tonight. First, our communities have been hurting. COVID is only exposing the sick statistics about how our country and housing market have been designed to rob and harm people of all backgrounds, uh, but especially for people of color. Uh, before the pandemic hit, housing was the biggest expense for most Americans across race and class lines. 47% of renters spend more than a third of their income on rent, while 11 million give more than half of their income to their landlord according to estimates from the Survey of Household Economics and Decision Making. 57% of renters cannot afford a $400 unexpected expense. Second, the pandemic is deepening the wound. Due to layoffs, mass unemployments, renters and mortgage holders are going deep into debt, and many do not have a steady income for the foreseeable future. Um, and according to the National Multifamily Housing Council, one third of renters nationwide did not pay April rent. Millions more won't be able to pay in May, and we shouldn't have to. Third, this is a racial justice emergency. Um, we are seeing what many of us already knew, that this is hitting the intentionally and systemically created ghettos of America first and worst. This is a moment to see and feel the design of racial capitalism at work. Though the virus doesn't discriminate, every single system in America that impacts the, our lives daily are designed to discriminate. 
And so much of that architecture is embedded in our housing market and has driven our work to redefine how housing looks in this country. Now more than ever, we need a homes guarantee to get us through this crisis and to make sure that our communities' lives, literally who lives and who dies in moments like this, are never again defined by racist developers and bankers and where they wanna put their capital, but defined by people who have seen their lives and the lives of folks for generations who carry their legacy defined by how much money they have and where they live, actually able to define their communities. Housing is healthcare and you should be able to live a safe and healthy life anywhere. Finally, as the crisis deepens and spreads, our people are organizing, everything looks different now. We can't have tens of thousands flooding in the streets as we normally might, but nevertheless, our people are getting creative taking direct action, organizing their neighbors, and demanding what we all deserve. We have the power to disrupt the entire economy. We already are, and we should continue. But we shouldn't be fighting to recover something that was never meant to work for us. We must build power to win. We must build power to win immediate relief in the next stimulus package, and then on to changing the entire system. There is no other option. Now I should be passing it to my friend Ashley to help us imagine the road ahead. But I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge our fearless leader um, who has been putting together this campaign, uh, who has inspired all of us uh, with her tireless efforts for a homes guarantee and to hold really the safety and sanctity of like real and genuine organizing, um, whose birthday it is today. So if everybody on the panel would join me and if you're not on the panel we can't hear you sing with us anyway, wanted to sing a happy birthday to Tara Ligabier. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, to you. Happy birthday, dear Tara. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. That was so sweet. And our special guest is here to learn that it's my birthday, too. Love you all. Thank happy you. Happy birthday, Tara. Thank you. <laughs> All right, hope you're not too far behind, behind on time. And Ashley, go ahead. Awesome. Yes, happy birthday, Tara. Um, so everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Ashley Bennett, and I am a leader uh, with Ground Game LA and People Organized for Westside Renewal in Los Angeles. So all of the topics up for discussion this evening are very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I myself have experienced homelessness personally in my life as a child. And my mom and my sister are still struggling to survive in a broken housing system today. So from the point that I experienced homelessness myself, one of the primary goals and missions in my life has been to help build a better future for those who are experiencing homelessness. And my work revolves around serving and organizing our unhoused siblings in Los Angeles today. So to be real, this crisis period isn't going to end anytime soon. Even after the pandemic passes, which we all hope is very soon, our communities still stand to be hurting from this for years to come. As others have said before me on this call this evening, we're not just here for immediate relief, we're here to win a homes guarantee. But for today, I do wanna hear from all of you who've joined us on the call. I want everyone to start thinking about what is the biggest need in your community right now related to housing? What would bring you and your neighbors immediate relief? I want everyone to take a deep breath and take a moment to reflect and imagine with me, what would it take right now for our communities to stop suffering and to begin to heal? Think big, think about the federal government and what our asks need to be of them. Think small, think about your family, the folks in your building, your neighbors. Think about that and then go ahead and type your answers into the chat so everyone can see. I'm gonna go ahead and type mine as well. Awesome, I'm seeing a lot of rent cancellation. Tara says rent cancellation. Mo says elected leaders need to take a stance. Rent cancellation, healthy housing. Zero rent, canceling rent. Taking the burden of having to pay rent away. Love that. Thank you, Rose. David, universal accessibility. Tiana, 
rent suspension, followed by a homes guarantee. These are all amazing answers. Thank you all so much for sharing. These are all crucially important pieces of the puzzle. Yes, we need lots of alignment. We need to overhaul the system. Absolutely. <laughs> so to bring this all back in, thank you all again for sharing. The market has failed our people. Racial capitalism has oppressed our people and we need to build enough power to change all of that. But on the way there, it's clear that our people need immediate relief. A bunch of you shouted out rent cancellation. That was the most common answer on here. I know that would help so many of us here in LA right now. And that's what we're here to discuss tonight. So with that, I wanna go ahead and hand it over to our birthday queen, Tara. And she's going to describe our federal demands and key updates. Awesome. Thanks, Ashley. And thank you all again. What a special birthday. I wouldn't want to be spending it with anyone but you all and the fierce fighters on this call who are going to win rent cancellation today and a homes guarantee tomorrow. Um, I'm an organizer with the campaign for a national homes guarantee. And a month ago, a bunch of us got together with national partners and grassroots leaders. And we thought about what our communities needed to be protected through this emergency. And we came to a lot of the conclusions that we just saw a lot of you come to in the chat. We know that people who are housing insecure or currently homeless are at higher risk of being exposed to the virus, becoming ill, and suffering catastrophic health outcomes. Low-income tenants are also at risk if they get ill and can't work because they're monitoring symptoms or watching kids, and therefore they can't make the rent. Millions of Americans are already housing cost burdened, as John said before and over half a million people have already been sleeping on the streets on any given night in America, the richest country in the history of the world. 40% of people don't have the cash to cover a $400 emergency, right? We all know this. So we demanded federal action to transfer cash immediately to Americans. We wanted to institute a rent and mortgage suspension, an action of a nationwide eviction moratorium, a ban on utility shutoffs, and a mandatory expansion of services and then homes and expanded services for people experiencing homelessness. In addition, we called for immediate support for public housing residents like Rose and the insurance of a just green transition after the pandemic. Now, since we've drafted those demands and as unemployment grows and the desperation in our, in our communities unfortunately continues to grow, the rent and mortgage suspension piece has risen to the top of our list of priorities. And we have been so honored to work with Representative Omar and her team to draft a rent and mortgage suspension bill, which she will introduce tomorrow. And I'll let her tell you more about that. But I wanna be clear about something. When I say that we helped write this bill, I mean that grassroots leaders like the folks on this panel and like all the rest of you in this chat had your hands all over this bill. And you can tell because it's damn good. I also really wanna take a second to shout out Kelly Misowitz with Representative Omar's office. She's the legislative director. And I can say with full confidence that Representative Omar and all of her staff really believe in what we believe in, which is that the movement should be governing with the people that the movement elects. And I have seen that played out in real time in the last week as we've worked on this incredible bill. Our folks told us loud and clear, this cannot be an exercise in ideological purity. This is not something that we're interested in as an abstraction. We actually need to win rent and mortgage suspension. So the organizing challenge is actually what comes next. And I'm excited to dig in with you on how we start working tomorrow to make sure that this is part of the next stimulus package. And with that, I'm gonna introduce Sabrina from Minnesota to introduce her Congresswoman. Uh, hi, my name is Sabrina. I am a grassroots leader with Take Action Minnesota in People's Action. Take Action Minnesota's purpose is to build a wide state, uh, multiracial, multigenerational, gender diverse, independent political power that challenges corporate powers, structural racism, and gender oppression. Our goal is to generate a new politics to win and wield a power to govern a politics that uh, people that is people-centered, um, agenda-driven, focused on changing structural inequality and freeing all of us to live lives of peace, prosperity, and uh, joy. 
Representative Ilhan Omar is the embodiment of our values as a Muslim, an immigrant, hijabi woman, and <clears throat> I have always admired Ilhan. She embodies what it means to be powerfully unapologetic, the woman that I always wanted to be. Her resilience, elegance, and the way that she treats those who mistreat her is something that I admire and she should be admired for. She, <clears throat> she's a fighter for the people, for homes and racial justice, and so much else. With that said, I would like to introduce you guys now to Ilhan Omar. Ooh, thank you, Sabrina. That was a little much. I, I was getting emotional. <laughs> Um, and happy birthday to Tara. Uh, it's so good to see you again. Um, it's really exciting to have this opportunity. I know there's a lot of talk about social distancing, but we're only physically um, distant. Uh, we are socially connecting every single day. Um, I'm going to uh, quickly talk about why this um, is important to me and, uh, and we'll leave you with Kelly because I know uh, it's dinner time and I'm a mother of three, so I've got to go feed my children um, their, their dinner at this moment. Um, but it's, it's really exciting, actually, uh, as, um, as we are having a lot of conversations of what to do today um, and, and looking forward to and not letting up on what we need to do tomorrow and the work that still needs to go on. The, this crisis that we are currently in is more than just a public health crisis. It's an economic crisis. Uh, we know that debt is piling up for renters and mortgage holders, despite not many having a steady income um, for foreseeable future. There is a lot of conversation about the $1,200 re um, relief fund that people are getting, but we know that doesn't even cover rent for many people, let alone allow them to have meals um, or, or pay any of their uh, other costs. Mass displacement, um, home foreclosures, and the shutting off of businesses are imminent unless aggressive measures are taken immediately. Families will lose their homes and the housing market will suffer irreparable damage. Already calls for rent strike, as, as Tara said, um, are echoing across this nation as tenants withhold payment indefinitely. Um, we're lucky here in Minnesota to have an eviction monitorium, uh, but that doesn't really exist across the country and that's something that needs to be instituted. We're also starting to have conversations here in Minnesota and we hope that people will across the country of what happens as soon as the national emergency declaration or state emergency declarations end. Uh, will people be evicted the next day? How can we put protections in place? The federal government has a responsibility to act now to prevent a total collapse of the national housing market, which is why I'm excited to introduce this bill tomorrow that will institute a national monitorium on rent and home mortgage payments to last through the duration of this pandemic. Under my legislation, payments on all rent rental homes will be canceled and landlords will be able to have the opportunity to apply for their losses um, as they will be covered by the federal government through a rental property relief fund to be administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development HUD. Additionally, all home mortgages um, will be able to have their payments suspended with mortgage holders being eligible to apply for a similar had operated home lenders relief fund. Uh, and this bill, as Tara said, is um, one that is the brainchild of many of you who are on the ground, who have your ears um, with, with activists and organizers. And we're just delighted to be able to have the opportunity to do this with you. Additionally, all home mortgage payments will be suspended under our um, legislation with mortgage um, with mortgage um, holders being eligible to apply for a similarly had operated um, home lenders relief fund. But the housing crisis, as you all know, didn't begin with um, the coronavirus crisis. It existed before. Across the nation, families were already struggling with homelessness and housing insecurity. 
Uh, last year, the National Low Income Housing Coalition found no state or major metropolitan area in the entire nation has an adequate supply of rental housing for its poorest renters. And as a result, 12 million renters are severely housing cost burden, spending more than half of their income on um, housing. That includes many of us, myself, um, a lot of my staff. This is why this issue is, is quite personal for us. In my home state uh, of Minnesota, over 10,000 people were homeless on a given night uh, last year, the highest number ever recorded, and 6,000 of them were youth, which means that children are showing up, were showing up in our schools without having a place to go home to. Meanwhile, the federal government has not really made a, a large scale investment in affordable housing since the New Deal. The construction of new public housing has been banned since the 1990s, forcing more than 1.6 million families onto endless um, waiting lists to public housing and another 2.8 million families into waiting lists for vouchers. The COVID-19, as many people have talked about, has really exposed the glaring racial disparities that have lost, long existed in our state and across this country. And I think we have an opportunity to really create policies that will help remake and reshape uh, our systems in a more equitable way. Uh, if anything positive will ever come out of this crisis, I hope it is the policies that um, me and my colleagues have been advocating for, things like Medicare for all, housing for all, universal cash assistance, and debt cancellation. Uh, we now have an opportunity to push forth um, a, a really cohesive agenda on what it means to be economically secure in our country and what it means to once for all get rid of the kind of economic and racial disparities that we've seen across this country. Uh, I know that so many people are uh, really feeling the pain, the economic pain of uh, this pandemic. Uh, and this public health uh, crisis, once we have a solution to, to this virus, is not going to end because um, we, we've already, we are already seeing the signs of um, the mental health impact that it's having on, on people. Uh, and so it's going to be really important for us to aggressively continue to advocate for people to have access to everything that they need to continue to lead a dignified life. So thank you all for having me and, and for giving us the opportunity to work um, in lockstep with you and trying to get relief for everyone in our community. Thank you so much, Representative Omar. It's amazing to have you with us and thank you for your leadership and your courage. You're always such an inspiration. Um, now we're gonna open up to take some questions. And as we said, um, Representative Omer might have to run to dinner, which is great, and totally support your kids getting fed, of course. Um, but Kelly, who's her legislative director, can stick around and co-conspire with us. I want to remind you all that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom app. So if you haven't yet, drop your questions in there. Bye, Representative Omar. Thank you. Um, drop your questions in the box. We've gotten a couple already, so I'm going to call the first one out. Um, we had a question in the box from Brandy, who says, what support do you expect on this new bill in Congress and the Senate? Are there any co-sponsors? And I would add to that, just Kelly, what's your thought on what the strategy is to actually win this thing? Yes, happy to answer there. Sorry, can everyone hear me okay? Wonderful. Yes, so we do have a number of co-sponsors and you might be able to see, but I have got my laptop right to my right because co-sponsors are rolling in as we speak. So, so far we have um, Mr. Pocan, Ms. Jayapal, who are both the co-chairs of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. So that sets a really good standard, I think, for the rest of the members there, as well as the squad. So we've got Rashida Tlaib, AOC, and Ayanna Presley on the bill. And I have just added Mr. Chewy Garcia. So we, as Tara knows, we work really hard to get tax ready in time and a lot of members are waiting to see the text and we're viewing it now. So I'm hoping to be adding a lot more people over the next few days. Um, there is some interest in the Senate on doing this. I know that Mr. Sanders is interested 
And we've even have some strange bell bed fellows. I, I showed a text to Tara, or a, sorry, not a text, a tweet with Tara. Um, Mr. Rick Scott talked about having a rent cancellation bill and the need for it. So I think there is some appetite there. And the strategy, I think, for the Progressive Caucus is to keep keep the voices up, to have folks like you calling for this is the most important thing because I believe that leadership will really hear that. And I know that there's quite a push for rental assistance right now. And while that is one solution, we think this is a bigger, better, more long-term solution. So continuing to keep the voices going and make sure that we and folks know that we aren't looking for compromise in this next stimulus bill. We've had three so far with plenty of compromises and that this is what the people want to see. I think will be the most successful strategy. Awesome. And Kelly Todd asks for the specifics of the bill. I wonder if you could just run through the key components again um, so that Todd and others uh, can be sure to know what's in there. Sure thing. Happy to. So the biggest piece of, of course, all rents and all mortgages on primary homes will be canceled. So it will be made retroactive, taking us back to April 1st. And it would last through the duration of the national emergency that's been declared around the pandemic with the last cancellation coming the last calendar month after it were to end. So say it were to be declared over September of this year, October, would the rents there would be, would be canceled. Um, it will be automatic and the Department of Housing and Urban Development is meant to notify all folks that they do not have to pay these payments and that they are not due. Uh, and then there will be relief funds set up within the Department of Housing for landlords and lenders to apply to. And they have to show proof that they have got these leases, um, that these leases exist and that they, they own the mortgages. And then in a tiered system based on needs and resources, they would be given uh, relief and the federal government would cover the costs of the rents and mortgages that have been canceled. And at no point in the future will they be able to come after the residents for those payments. It's a complete, complete full cancellation. And then there's another piece that I think I'm the most excited about and came really from, as Sarah mentioned, the brainchild of everyone here, which is the creation of uh, um, an affordable housing acquisition fund. So I think as we saw happen a lot in 2008 after an economic downturn, there's a lot of changes in the market. You see a lot of landlords selling, looking to make a profit and get out of the business. And so we don't wanna see the kind of snatch up by private equity that we saw after 2008. So this fund would allow the um, nonprofits, community land trust, cooperative, a whole host of low income housing providers would be eligible to apply to this fund and purchase any kind of multifamily system that goes back up on the market. In fact, if you are the owner of a multifamily property, you would have to alert the Department of Housing first so that they would have time to alert folks that they would be eligible. And then there would be a number of fair lending and fair renting practices that are attached to all three of these things. So if there's a purchase of the properties, anyone, any landlord who is applying to the relief fund or any lender applying to the relief fund all have to abide by a number of things like just cause evictions, a rent freeze for the next five years. They wouldn't be allowed to bar anyone based on immigration status or credit history, criminal history, none of those things. So basically the agreements that they would have to get to have the relief is kind of a, what I see is almost a pilot program of the social housing we're all, we're all hoping to get to. And then as, mar as these properties come up on the market and they're purchased by these um, entities, we hope to see them become little pieces of social housing so everyone can see them flourish and see that that is a great way to operate our housing market. Awesome, thank you so much, Kelly. I have another strategy question for you, but first I'm gonna um, defer to a couple of the other panelists on a very interesting question from Michael Spaulding. Michael asks, can't we remove certain incentives for real estate speculation, like changing IRS rules so that real estate depreciation for rental property is not eligible for tax deduction? So this is really interesting, and I wanna hand it over first to our comrade Maurice, to maybe just define for people, what do we mean when we're talking about real estate speculation and what happened after the last financial crisis that we're trying to guardrail against this time? Sure. Um, so you heard, you heard Kelly mention uh, that after 2008, a bunch of private equity groups came in and scooped up housing. Um, you may remember in your own neighborhood that after that scoop up happened, it's not like 
a bunch of new people moved in and the buildings were flourishing and uh, everything was great and happy, they were participating in this practice called speculation. And that's essentially when um, an entity, a large entity comes in, they buy a piece of property and they have no intention of doing anything except for using it as a commodity to make more money. So often they sit on it for extended periods of time until the market turns and then they sell it or develop it um, or something else. Um, so we saw a tremendous amount of that from private equity and hedge funds after, uh, after the foreclosure crisis. Um, and there's a real risk of that, of that happening uh, now, as Kelly said. One of the things in the original Homes Guarantee Plan that uh, helps to prevent that um, is making sure that folks, uh, putting, putting stipulations in on how long uh, folks have to hold on to their properties if they're not buying a property for their own to, to actually live in. Um, usually speculation doesn't occur in the property that you actually live in. It's an extra investment property. So making sure that folks are actually holding on to that for a long period of time um, and then using the power of the IRS, like you said, and taxes to make sure that we're disincentivizing people, um, you know, scooping, scooping up homes from uh, folks who are in hard times um, and just saving them to, to make a profit. Awesome. Thanks so much, Maurice. Um, okay, a couple rapid fire questions about the bill, Kelly. We've got a question from Debbie. Would all tenants, including those with high incomes, have rent cancellation, i.e., is there any income eligibility? Um, Joss uh, wants to know what is the estimated cost of the bill? And then Daisy wants to know how does this bill um, benefit immigrants, and specifically undocumented immigrants or folks in mixed status families? Sure, happy to weigh in and I might have to ask you to repeat them because I'm not sure I'll re remember all three of those. But firstly, there is no income restriction on the bill, so anyone is eligible. I will say the only piece is that you cannot have the cancellation adopted on more than just your primary residence. So if you have vacation homes, sorry, that's too bad. You're going to have to pay for your vacation home. Um, and you would not be able to double down if you were, say, an investor landlord. So uh, someone who owns a condo and rents it out cannot get both the rental cancellation and have their mortgage forgiven. Other than that, there are no income restrictions. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First, as I think we probably all have seen in the news, for the federal government to respond, especially in an emergency, the more parameters you put on something, the harder it gets. And so we think that the best way to go around about this is to have it be universal, get the assistance out there, make it canceled for everyone so that those who need it the most can benefit. And then there is room in this bill for HUD to kind of come up and work with Treasury in the future on guidance that maybe in the next year, two years, three years, there would be some taxes due back for folks who maybe didn't need this benefit quite as much as others. But we think because there is such a high risk of folks being homeless in the very near term, we want to get the money out the door as soon as possible. Um, and the second question, I'm sorry, Tara, what was the second question? How much will the bill cost? I wish I could answer that. I know that it's quite a bit of money. <laughs> Uh, but I don't know how much. And we specifically put um, some legislative technical language in there saying that Congress just has to appropriate as much as it costs. And that's important because if you put cap on that fund, you see what we're seeing with the small business fund right now is that it will run out. And very soon you might see a number of landlords saying that they are demanding their rent because they didn't get their due from the federal government. So the cost is probably well into a trillion dollars or more but I think that it's something that is not really, uh, I, I guess I wouldn't call it so much a cost as an investment. We're seeing that level of investment in making sure that corporations um, and state and local governments are standing up and that their markets are, are as safe as possible. And I think we should be doing the same thing for people. Maurice, the do you wanna, oh, oh, we'll come back to the last question because I do wanna make sure we get there, but I think Maurice wanted to weigh in on how much does it cost? Yeah, um, just to, just weighing in really quickly on on that question. Um, you know, we just had a the last stimulus bill that passed was uh, a, was over two trillion dollars, and um, unfortunately, as Representative Omar was saying, a lot of that was captured by corporations and the wealthy, and we really hope to do better with the next stimulus bill. Um, but the question of how much does it cost never seems to come up 
when we're talking about the United States military or bailing out corporations or any of the other things that, that uh, you know, we spend just untold blank check trillions of dollars on. Um, so I actually don't think that you can put a cost on making sure that folks are able to keep a roof over their head. Um, and in this moment, um, if not in this moment, when can we guarantee that folks have some housing stability and has some housing safety. So I really appreciate Representative Omar for pushing forward with this. Um, even as folks will, I'm sure that we'll hear a chorus of how much did it cost from lots and lots of folks. Um, but, I, but I know that I'm ready to fight for it no matter what. And I'm really, really glad that uh, Representative Omar is standing with us. Any other panelists want to weigh in on the costs and how we need to reframe that conversation, John? Um, yeah, I wanted to say that um, how much will it cost to evict 100 million people? Um, how much will it cost um, to our nation to create even further housing instability by completely redefining the exact same neighborhoods that were originally redlined? So when you look at these COVID maps, you look at redlining maps, it's all a clear strategy. And so when we look at like, what is the cost of continuing doing what we're doing and the cost of trying to recover to a norm that was already harming people. And I think those costs are put in places that do not get brought up um, in, in conversations in moments like this. And that's why we're doing this work. Um, and there's never really like a cost analysis of like how much does it cost to take action versus how much it costs not to take action. Um, so I think that's one way that we can definitely start to push back against that because there is absolutely no way housing courts and all of the systems and localities can handle the waves of people who are going to be housing insecure if nothing is done. And I think that there really probably isn't even a way to calculate that. So we need to bring in more of that conversation of what does it cost for us not to act. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Okay, we've got a couple more questions. I wanted to go back to the one that Daisy Vega from Los Angeles asked before. Um, Daisy lives in a community um, where there are a lot of mixed status families and immigrants who are undocumented or who are otherwise non-citizens. Um, Kelly, what are, what are your thoughts on how this bill and what we're fighting for more broadly in the next stimulus package can apply to undocumented folks and folks of mixed status? Yeah, I think it's very important that we make sure that the, any kind of benefit that is in this bill is in the next stimulus applies equally to everyone that is here. Uh, I think it's uh, pretty sad what we're seeing with the last stimulus and we, I, I hope, are learning our lessons there. We were very careful about the way that we crafted this bill to make sure that there would be extremely difficult for this administration or any administration to make anyone ineligible based on immigration status. So firstly, we tied the ability to get the rental cancellation directly to just the fact that you have any kind of lease, whether it is a written lease, the traditional kind of mortgage um, structure that you might have, or even if it's a verbal agreement to a lease, it's covered under this and there are no other eligibility requirements. Therefore, there would be no reason for the administration to see if you had a difference in immigration status or a mixed status in the family. So it applies equally. And then I think we are doing a good benefit to the future of the housing market by adding that to the future in order to take a part of the relief fund. Any landlord any, any would have to make sure that they are not allowed to consider immigration status or deny anyone based on immigration status. And for the lenders and the mortgages, they have some reporting requirements to make sure that they are showing what they're doing, where are their offices, what is the demographics of their lending practices so that we can better see some of the discrimination that goes on and stop it. So hopefully it's um, providing the benefits that should already be there and avoiding some of the problems that we've had with the last stimulus prop package and making the rental and mortgage markets better for the future. Thanks, Kelly. We've got a really important question from Caitlin Penner. Does the bill do anything to move homeless folks into permanent or temporary housing? Is there any national legislative push for this? Yeah, so I think, I'm, I'm glad to say, I think there is quite a bit of national push. You know, we are not the only people working on really important housing bills right now. I will give a little shout out to um, Mr. Nagoose from Colorado, who just joined a bill that Representative Elmore uh, joined yesterday that makes a really good investment i think there puts a lot of money into the emergency grants and allows kind of states and localities to be more innovative 
with the way they use them. So um, it would allow states basically to just rent hotel rooms and get the folks in there right away and then work towards the permanent solutions because I think it's important that we allow um, the folks on the ground to be more creative and show us what they need to do to solve these problems at a time like this. Um, I think that's evident from this call because it's you all that brought us these ideas and pushed this forward and we need to be doing that even more during the pandemic. In this bill in particular, I think it will be particularly helpful because you, we are creating some mechanisms in those relief funds that say for future renting, um, you do have to make these available first to folks with vouchers. And so making sure that more vouchers are being circulated and getting into the system and, and not kind of uh, being, being solved off will hopefully keep that backlog and the wait list from getting longer and longer. Um, and it's also creating a lot of um, protections from just people being forced into homeless shelters to begin with, because I think that's what we would see um, immediately if we don't enact something along these lines. Uh, and one other thing that we're particularly proud of in here is that for each piece of the program that HUD is creating, they have got to touch base and work collaboratively with the local housing authorities and the local housing experts, because I think that will give them the ability to design the programs in a way that are gonna help the homeless populations of each city and state, which are very different. You know, New York is very different from Minneapolis. Minneapolis is very different from rural towns in Northern Minnesota. So giving that state and local voice along with the federal department, I think is gonna be the most important piece there. Thank you, Kelly. Um, okay, selfishly, I wanna ask a really interesting question from Brandy Coleman. Brandy asks, if this doesn't pass because of control in the White House is a real estate mogul, um, do you all endorse a strike as the next move? Um, I sort of wanna take a first stab there because I kind of get, I think it gets us back to what Kelly was saying in the beginning that we're finding ourselves some perhaps unlikely allies uh, people like Senator Rick Scott, or for those of you who don't know, he's a Republican from Florida, called for a rent moratorium, right? And I think one thing that we've been trying to meditate on as a campaign team is that our winnability calculator is broken, right? Like the political context is shifting around us. So I think instead of asking right now, like, what do we do if we don't win this? Our main challenge is to organize to win this and create the conditions where this is just the inevitability, right? Organizing is about con creating the conditions to change what's possible or what's winnable. And then I think it's really interesting to consider the idea of a strike. Um, and this has been something that I know a lot of us have been chewing over for a while now, but there's already this like mass number of people across the country who's not a who aren't able to pay their rent, like a third of people, um, as John was saying in his grounding in the beginning. And that's not what we would traditionally understand as a rent strike. But in this context, we might consider that a rent strike. And that is a really disruptive force in our economy. So I want to throw it to maybe John to speak for a second on, yeah, what's our take? Like, are we calling for a rent strike? Um, or how, how are we thinking about what's already happening as a rent strike? So one, I want to say that we need to start to get more free um, about the way that we think about ideas and language. Um, this is an unprecedented moment that is going to require unprecedented response and action. So the best language that we have right now for like mass non-participation in the system is a rent strike. I think that right now it's inevitable that people are not going to be able to pay, whether that is a strategic or like leverage position to get something out of another party is something that's evolving. And so I definitely think that we should be considering and working toward the strike. I just think that that has to be done with a pace that might be a little slow for folks. And that's why we're, we're, we're trying to do multiple strategies as far as getting people to organize where they're at, and then also trying to legislate for people to be able to have the safety to to do that work. Um, so I say we're trying to weave the two together um, and tap into you know what people are really expressing in the moment, which is they can't pay rent and they don't feel that they should have to move because they can't pay rent because of something that's out of all of our control. So in sum, yes, we are supporting tenants across the country who are organizing rent strikes. And if you are one of those tenants, we want to hear from you. Specifically, John is working on supporting people in the basics of tenant organizing. And we meet back here every Thursday night to workshop how we do that and how we do that in a time of social distancing. 
So thank you so much to the panel for answering questions. I'm gonna hand it now over to our comrade Ty from Washington State. Hey guys, uh, thanks for joining in. My name is Ty and I'm a community organizer with Washington Community Action Network here in Olympia, Washington. I've personally experienced housing instability since I was a kid. Um, I grew up in Portland, Oregon, right in the height of gentrification when they were trading, trading paychecks for houses in my neighborhood. Most recently, my children and I were given a no cause eviction in our affordable housing so our property, so our property could get beautified and rent could be raised. It wasn't until my neighbor knocked on my door one day with emotions that mirrored the way I felt and a plan to organize that I know winning was possible. Through our organizing efforts, we were able to win a few more months, and in those moments, I was reminded that we were not alone. My community needs a rent suspension today and a homes guarantee for the future. We have our work cut out for us. Representative Omar introducing the bill is a great win, but the real work starts tomorrow. We have to organize to make sure that the rent and mortgage suspension is a part of the negotiations about what's in the next stimulus package. Renters like me and you are dealing with ramifications of living under weak tenant protections. We need to organize our neighbors, not just to win demands from our landlords, but also to win public policy that can protect us all right now. And then we need to keep building power. We all know we're not here just for immediate relief. We are here for homes guarantee. We need a home, we need a home guarantee that puts people before profit and ensures that everyone has a safe, accessible, sustainable, permanently affordable home. If we had homes guarantee and if housing was a public good instead of a commodity in America, dealing with this crisis would be a lot different. So when we think about what it means to win in this context, we have to begin planning for the future. When we as a people march together, we are the majority. Through collective action, we challenge and shift dynamics of power. The greatest movements are led by people directly impacted by an issue. So thank you all so much for fighting with us. Each one of our roles in these movements are very important. Without each other, we cannot succeed. So now I'm gonna hand it over to David Zolson. Thanks, Ty. Hey all, my name is David Zolton. I he, him pronouns, and I'm a grassroots leader in Chicago with One North Side, uh, part of People's Action. I'm personally impacted by housing every single day of my life as a person with disabilities who can't work currently and is dependent on a disability payment that is less than my rent. Um, if I didn't have the help of my family and friends, then I wouldn't be able to survive. Friends and family that have all been deeply impacted by this crisis as well, of course. So I've been feeling exhausted and angry at the lackluster response for the people. But it's the work like this that really gets me super hyped and everything that I'm hearing here from Kelly, from Representative Omar, that's getting me more and more excited about everything that's uh, possible and everything that can happen. And the energy in the chat has just been amazing. So, I, you know, I've got some asks for you. You all sound like you're ready to win. And... It's not just excitement that is going to win this for us. We need to be fueled by our outrage, right? If you're outraged, say so, because we need to, we need to funnel that. You know, we've got Rose in New York, Ashley in LA, we've got Ty in Washington, and our comrades in Minnesota, all across the country. We all need to be outraged. Millions of us can't pay our rent due to layoffs, illnesses, or like me, the people in our community, and we shouldn't have to right now. Some of us in our communities don't have a home at all. We don't have an affordable, accessible, and safe place to call home for a long time. And there are industries that are being bailed out to the tunes of billions of dollars. It's blasphemous. So I need you to take action with me. Here's the plan. Action item number one. We need to make demands that your, your representative cancel rents and mortgages along with Representative Omar. So she's going to introduce her rent and mortgage suspension bill in the morning. And Congress needs to hear from us immediately so that they consider this a, a central part of the next stimulus package. We're going to be sending out a follow-up email in the morning as soon as we have the bill number, and that's going to have an action tool for you to zap your representatives tomorrow. 
So I would need you to commit to checking that email as soon as you get it and to start using your activist mojo. I want you to sign your name in the chat right now if you're ready to take action with us tomorrow. All right, excellent. That's a lot of names, I'm loving it, I'm loving it. Keep them coming, keep them coming. So action item number two, while you're putting your names there, I want you next to be thinking about the long-term stuff. We've got the immediate relief. I want you to sign our petition for immediate relief and for a homes guarantee for the future. We're collecting signatures to demonstrate public support for the rent and mortgage suspension, aka hashtag rent zero, hashtag cancel rent, right? A national eviction moratorium, nationwide ban on utility shutoffs, homes for people experiencing homelessness, and so much more. I want you to go to homesguarantee.com right now and make sure that you've signed that petition. That is so important to show your support. And action item number three, I want you to make a commitment right here, right now. Every week we've been asking folks to make a commitment to take radical action with us on May 1st. I want you to keep reaching out to the people you know, the people in your building, and to do everything you can to get ready for mass action for housing on the 1st, and then come back here next week and hear more from John about what's coming up next. Thank you so much. And Maurice, back to you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I am so fired up. Thank you to all of the speakers. Um, a special thanks to Representative Ilan Omar um, and uh, Kelly Misalitz from her office. Um, thank you so, so much for, uh, for helping to lead this fight and for listening to community members uh, uh, in this housing push. Thank you. So, You'll receive an email from us uh, from us tomorrow morning that is a follow up from this call. Um, if you want to get in touch with us or uh, check what we're up to on different channels, you can look on Twitter. The hashtags are rent zero and homes guarantee. Um, and uh, we will see you back on this field call next week. Same time, same place. Everyone stay safe and take care.